Good morning. So I'm going to talk on. Uh, hmm. Not good. I'm going to talk on personal finance for the surgeon. Uh, I definitely gave this talk last year. I think I gave it uh, two years before. So that means that uh, our senior residents have heard this talk three times. So I may make it a little more interactive. This is a quote from uh, Francis Bacon. It's very true. Money's a great servant, but it's a horrible master. This is a quote I really like from Jerry Groupman. Uh, Dr. Groupman is uh, a physician author uh, and internist. And I think he summarizes the important trait of what makes for a good investor in the United States. So hope is not unbridled optimism, but it is a view for a path to a better future, acknowledging all the problems and all the pitfalls along the way. It lines up, uh, you've seen this but before, these are my seven P's to be. Be participatory, be professional, we should be a problem solver, be committed to performance improvement, the two paradoxical P's, be passionate, but be patient, and be perseverant. Be perseverant. The last P is probably key to uh, successful long-term financial investing. So I'm going to show you some things that there is a lot of misinformation and so these are not the only popular authors who are, uh, who are reliable. Uh, and I hesitate to show these uh, because I don't actually follow all these people all the time. But uh, uh, there's no question that John Bogle and uh, the uh, followers of John Bogle are super solid, very reliable, not in it to make a bunch of money. But uh, so, so because there's an awful lot of really, really bad stuff. Uh, John Bogle was, uh, you probably don't know him, but John Bogle was really the inventor or the innovator for the index mutual fund, which really transformed investing uh, in the United States. And that uh, second edition of, the, of John Bogle's followers is a really good introductory book. The others are also not bad. The Richest Man in Babylon is the oldest. It's written in a style of 1926, so it's hard for a lot of people to read, but it has the advantage it's very, very short. So let's start with first things first. What do you, you, I'm going to direct my comments to these two quadrants. What do you, as a young person in surgery, need to know it's not what you earn, it's what you save. I'm going to show you data that shows that physicians tend to be high income, low net worth people. They make a lot of money, but they don't save it. So the best way to do that is regular, scheduled, routine savings of 10 to 30 percent of your income starting as early as possible. If you do not want money to be your master, this is the key. If you do not do this, 30 years from now, money will be your master. It's not what you earn, it's what you save. So the, I've got five pitfalls. First pitfall is the most common. If you take nothing away, not, nothing away from this talk, you should take this away. Pitfall number one is not, not saving or not saving enough of one's income. That's the, key. That's the number one pitfall. There's the 80-20 rule in business. People know what the 80-20 rule is. Uh, 
Twenty percent of things make eighty percent of the difference. So, so, so the most you can make almost every personal financial mistake possible. Not everyone, but almost everyone. Uh, and if you save enough and invest it in long-term growth, you'll you'll survive every one of those mistakes. If you don't, there's no there's no real solution. So saving is key. So, but we all have a, we all have a problem saving. How, 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 many, how many people, non-faculty, how many people follow that rule that I just said? So, so, so maybe there's, there's like 1% uh, of you, 5% uh, max. Uh, so, so how to save more? And this is not, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say that I've made uh, every mistake I would talk about, I've probably made. Uh, so how to save more? Well, wherever you're employed, you should really look. You should seek for this. You should not wait because people are not going to come and offer it to you on a, on a platter. You should look for mandatory retirement saving plans, and you need to maximize that investment as much as possible you need to put into that. Why? Because it's the ultimate in pay yourself first. If you're a UT employer, if you're a UT employee in the optimal in the optional retirement program, you don't have to you don't have to think about saving the money. It's saved automatically. And even better, it's matched by the employer. You don't have to think about it, it's done. And before you know it, you're wealthy. That's the basic of what happens. Pay yourself first. So if you're not if you're not in one of those retirement plans, pay yourself first before it goes into your checking. If you're not saving anything, the maximum for an IRA is $5,500. That's $15 a day. That's a lot for a resident. It's an incredibly large amount for a student. But uh, save something. I'm going to show you what $50 a month invested over the course of an investment lifetime translates into. Anybody know? You should know. Everybody should know up here who's seen this talk. This is going on three times. What is $50 a month invested in a vehicle that mimics the U.S. stock market turn into by age 70? $1.2 million. $1 million. There's no, one in this, <clears throat> there's no one in this room who can't save $50 a month. Well, maybe there's a few. There's probably more than a few on that side. Long term, there's no one here who can't do it, though. So if you're not saving anything, <clears throat> commit future pay increases to savings. What do most future pay increases go to? Luxury. They most often go to luxury. And once you spend it, it's gone. It's not there anymore. And you can't save it if it's not there. And we should assess our lifestyle. If you're not saving anything, try this. 1% of this next month's income, just 1%, Save 1% and try to increase it 1% for each of the next 12 months. You will not notice it at all. You will really not notice it. 1% and increase 1% a month. It's not just enough to save, though. Uh, your savings have to work hard for you. They have to work as hard as you do. So what that means is that your savings must accrue at a rate that outpaces two things, inflation and taxation. If, it, if your savings are not growing at a rate that is greater than the combination of inflation plus taxation, you're effectively losing money on every investment you're doing. So you've got options. You've got bank accounts, bonds, stocks, real estates, and your business, those things uh, have the potential for, uh, for uh, accruing. Some of them, as you'll see, do not uh, 
have a chance of outpacing those two things. Gene Chatsky is a uh, sort of money self-help person, uh, and she has five rules that we have to do if we're going to be financially free. You have to make a decent living, not a, not a great living. You have to make a decent living. You have to spend less than what you make. The money that you're uh, saving, you need to invest, and you need to invest it in, in, in vehicles that work hard for you. You have to protect yourself, and you have to give back. Five simple rules. Very simple, very easy to understand. Pitfall two is invest in your hard-earned and already taxed. By the way, it's already taxed. Okay, you, 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 the money that you're going to be saved has already been taxed once. But the investing assets that don't outpace inflation plus taxation is probably the second most common pitfall. So there are some, I, br I broke these down into A, B, C, D, E, the problems of pitfall two. It's not as simple as pitfall one. The first problem I think for young, for young surgeons, people who are not, who, who don't spend a lot of time thinking about finance, is just a lack of understanding and in, in inconvenience. It's, it's a little hard to find uh, a way to save easily that's why you should look for your, your, your uh, employer plans. Uh, not putting the, the, uh, your savings in the right asset class. A failure to look at cost. I'm going to show you how much cost matters in the investment world. A failure to persevere in difficult times. And salespeople, newsletters, scams and the general financial press it is fraught with misinformation and essentially propaganda financial advising or finance is one of the areas in life where uh, what you pay for you don't get so a little bit about inflation in the past half century where inflation has been the has hit savings the hardest uh, if you look at 1962 the cost of a Hershey bar was uh, five cents uh, now it's about a dollar you can see that the the, the compound annual rate of inflation uh, over this half century a little more than a half century has been about four percent you can see that uh, New York Times cost five cents in 62 now it's uh, two to three dollars. Gasoline costs thirty-one cents. Now it's it says three. That it's in two thousand fourteen in the Northeast. I'm sure it's two dollars here. Uh, a hamburger, if you walked into McDonald's, uh, was twenty-eight cents. Uh, a new Chevrolet would cost you twenty-five twenty-nine in nineteen sixty-two. Uh, the only the only uh, uh, product on this that has not that's actually gotten cheaper over time is, uh, is the refrigerator freezer. Uh, so the consumer price index over the past 100 years, this is the measure of inflation, has been about 3.3% per year. The U.S. stock market has done approximately 10% per year over that time. We'll, sh we'll show you how that can be misleading and how it will, people will use it to mislead you. So... What are basic investment options? It's not complicated, but it's really, it, well, it can be super complicated, but the principles are not complicated. So a stock is a percent ownership in a company. Bonds are a percentage of a loan uh, in a company or government. If we buy a bond, we're buying uh, debt to a company or debt to uh, a government. Real estate, other hard assets such as gold, silver, diamonds, so convenience is a big issue for all of these things. For the average uninitiated person who did not come from wealth and whose family knows nothing about this, it, 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 is, it is daunting if you were going to go buy a stock. 
And you're, and you're actually going to get taken to the cleaners on cost, I can tell you. So what's convenient? How could it be more convenient? Mutual funds. So all a mutual fund is is pooling money from a, a collection of stocks or bonds, pool that money, and then a company is going to manage that for you. You're going to pay them a fee. They fall into two broad variants, actively managed funds. These are going to be marketed to you as I'm Ronnie Stewart. I'm the genius on Wall Street. I've outpaced the uh, market for the past five years, and I am going to make you a lot of money. The passively managed fund is very boring. It's incredibly boring. A computer, someone's people, a group of smart people like you, except in a different field, program, develop a, a data system and program at one time and it picks the stocks and it doesn't require a genius to do. It just picks the stocks and that's all you do. And it's going to pick a random sampling of those stocks, which amazingly does better than the highest paid experts on Wall Street can do. Those are your options. They're all pretty convenient if you can find the vehicle to do it, doesn't require a lot of knowledge, can happen automatically in the background of your life. As I showed on the previous slide, a mutual fund was an invention of the 20th century. It was a huge innovation financially. It really allowed for true in stock market, bond market investing for the average consumer. It's convenient. It's diversified. In, in an average mutual fund, one of those passively managed mutual funds, thousands of stocks. So it's diversified. It's liquid. What does liquid mean? Liquid means, Muhammad, is your house liquid? Why is it not liquid? It's, a, it's an asset. It's an asset. You couldn't turn it into cash today, correct? I can't if I switch the... It would be difficult for you to turn it into cash today, and you're going to be dependent upon what I'm willing to pay you for. Right. Okay? Well, a, a mutual fund is you can sell it today if you want. Uh, you're going to sell it at a market rate, but you, you could sell it immediately. Uh, you can get it at relatively low minimum purchase price, $50 a month. It's automatically, can automatically be reinvested, it's easy to keep records, and it gives you and me, average people with no financial expertise, professional money management expertise. And so the miracle of compound interest, this is from uh, uh, Burton Malkiel's book, A Random Walk Down Wall Street from Siegel. And this looks at what would be the worth of a $1, $1 investment in 1801 carried to uh, 2014. $1 invested in the U.S. stock market on average turns into $18 million over that time frame. You see the power of being an institutional investor? If, if you have a, a longer than an average human life, you can invest, and it can really make differences over long periods of time. If you invested in the bond market, that turns into $29,104. You may say, well, that looks not, not, you know, not, not that big a difference. Well, this is a logarithmic scale here. If you put it in gold, it turns into $85.87, and if only inflation, it turns into $19.39. $18 million versus $86. I don't know about you, but I know which one I'd pick. So uh, the question earlier, what is $50 a month invested every, every month, reliably invested every, every month, reinvested over the course of 
from 18 to age 70 turn into, you can see the miracle of compound interest. $50 a month turns into uh, over a million dollars. So what that means is almost everyone, not everyone, but almost everyone in the U.S. could be wealthy. That's hard to, it's hard for me to understand, so I'm going to make it simple. A similar thing would be if, uh, if, Dr. Sh if I was Dr. Schrenick's son and he gave me $8,000 at age 18 and he put it into account and said, Ronnie, don't touch this until age 70. Just keep it in the, just keep it reinvested in the U.S. stock market. That turns into to a similar amount of money. So $8,000 one-time investment over the uh, uh, a reasonable young person's lifetime turns into uh, $1.1 million. The miracle of compound interest. But what no one is going to tell you, or very few people are going to tell you, there is another, there's the tyranny of compound cost in the financial world. I gave you a best case scenario, no cost. So that's what this, it's a nice little calculator. You can get it on, get it on the internet. You can see that uh, the same, it's the same graph I just showed. 10% <clears throat> uh, return, no expenses or charges, turns into $1.1 million. Okay, with 0.2% expenses over the same time period, you still are a millionaire at the end, but you can see you have some expenses. And it's hard to see, but, but there's, the, there's the sales charge, which is in the fees, which are very small. The major cost is money that you were not able to reinvest. That's the major cost, opportunity cost. And that's, that's even at 0.2% expenses, which is a reasonably low cost mutual fund. Uh, but you're still a millionaire. Okay, but that's the average. The average expenses for a mutual fund, owning a mutual fund in the U.S. is 1.3% per year. If you, people are going to market things to you of 2.5% or 5%. You have a hedge fund, incredible expenses. So that doesn't really look too bad. At one year, this is one year, so you invest your uh, $8,000, and at uh, your final balance is uh, 8,685. That first year was 10%. That's where we sort of currently are in the stock market about. Uh, it's a pretty good year, feeling pretty good. Expenses are low, it's high five all around. But from age 18 to 70, operating expenses 1.3%. That, that cost compounds, just like the fund balance compounds, the cost compound. Now your final projected balance is $575,000. Most of, not, not, not most, but a very large percentage at even an average operating expenses, very large percentage go to, who does this go to? This goes to the company that's managing that fund. Okay, let's say I'm your friendly, very friendly stockbroker. I've got a great fund. It's run by Peter Lynch. It's outpaced the U.S. stock market for 15 years in a row. You got to do it. 2.3% expense. That's not that much, Dr. Stewart. 2.3%. Small. This is what it looks like, your fund balance. By the time you're 70, in that account, $338,000, and you can see who's getting most of the money. Not good. Costs matter. Costs matter a lot. They matter in other things, too, but it really matters a lot in investing. In fact, it's the most important thing. So what should be our 
my long-term investment strategy. I believe it would be looked for low cost, expense ratios less than 0.2% mutual funds invested in something like the U.S. stock market and U.S. bond fund, as much tax deferment as possible, automatic as possible, a mix of stock and bonds, routine monthly con contributions with at least 15% of your income. Pitfall 2B, risk and risk tolerance this is a quote from Mark Twain. <laughs> so people don't like to invest in the stock market because it's risky. And people lost all their savings. They lost all their savings in 2008. They lost all their savings in 1939. It is risky. It is the riskiest. In fact, this is, this is the, over the time, time span from 1935 to 2013, the worst one-year return of the U.S. stock market was minus 43%. The best return was plus 54%. Even over a 10-year period, for those poor people, I think this period was 2000 to 2010, uh, the U.S. stock market over a decade return was minus 1%. So it is not a short-term investment. The best return over that 10-year period was 20%. So Taylor Laramore, one of the Bogleheads, talking to young people, he was alive in the Great Depression. The U.S. stock market decreased by 89%. And he's talking here to us, saying, if you think you can hold on, to, if he's, they're, they're asking the question, could, could I hold an all-stock investment during a really bad downturn? I'll let you read what he says. And you may think, well, gosh, I made 100% this year and 89% the next year. It, since you're dealing with ratios, it doesn't work like that. You make 100% one year and you lose 90%, you are way in the hole. You've lost a lot of money. And if you needed those savings uh, immediately, you're in really uh, a difficult situation. So it's prudent to add bonds to stock portfolios. They may both fall at the same time, but uh, usually when there's a crash in the stock market, People put their money into uh, to bonds because they're less risky. Real estate's another way. And looking for other risky assets like the stock market that vary inversely is an option. So this looks at if you had 100% stocks or 100% bonds, what your worst annual loss would be. I already showed it, minus 43%. If you're 100% bonds, the worst annual loss is minus 8%. The average annual return for the U.S. stock market over this long time period, 10%. If you're in 100% bonds, it's 5.5%. You can see in the middle, particularly on these two uh, echelons, you can actually do quite well over long periods of time with a really good mix of stocks and bonds. So, again, I think it's prudent. Back to Jean Chatsky. She's very good behavioral writer on finance. She looked for seven traits of people who were wealthy, optimism, resilient, connectedness, drive, curiosity, intuition, and confidence. It's actually like you. But we tend to be high income, relatively low net worth earners. Why? Well, first, we get a late start. You get a late start both in earnings and savings. You're in this long period of training. <clears throat> there are certain expectations that some of you will feel that you have to have the nicest car, the nicest house. This is a bad expectation to put on people from a financial point of view. It leads to bad financial decisions. It leads to having uh, funding a lot of luxury uh, with debt. You're also super busy. You don't have enough time. This is probably the longest amount of time you're going to spend take, talking about personal finance 
in the next two years for some of you. You're also overconfident and arrogant. Uh, I, I'm just saying you are. My, my, I have a, a one. I have several very smart people in my family, but one of the ones who's not a physician <clears throat> points out that at every cocktail party, when they talk to a senior surgeon, they think they know everything about the situation they're talking about, regardless of how complicated or far abreast from their field. It makes surgeons for bad pilots, uh, and it makes bad investors. Just like if I came into you and I thought I knew all about surgery, I'd never done one minute of medical school or residency, you would think I was stupid. Well, guess, guess what the financial people think of you? So we take bad advice from people we think are friends. The cold caller. Anyone who calls you, if I call you out of the blue and I'm trying to sell you something, you should not take the call. Period. Happens all the time, though. This is uh, from 2016 Netscape. Salaries, reported salaries, orthopedics at the top, $443,000. Pediatrics, the bottom, $204,000. General surgery here, you can see the median's about $300,000 or so. That's our income. Right, that's right, it's a lot. It's unbelievable. Okay, this is net worth. You can see the good news is there's not as much of a difference in net worth that there, than there is with respect to, uh, and net worth is all of the things that I own uh, minus my, any liability and debt that I have. So my total, it's not what I earn, it's how much I have saved, including house and all that. But the scary, not good news from this is if you look at physicians 70 or older, 11%, 11% have a net worth of under $500,000. Remember, if I saved $50 a month, starting at age 18 to age 70, I would have twice that. So what, what are problems that affect physicians' net worth? Well, the good news is uh, three quarters of people say they've had no uh, financial loss in the past year. 2016, we'll say, was a good year. But about a quarter have problems with practice, bad investing decisions, or divorce. Probably the big three, losing money in your practice, bad investment decisions, divorce. Okay, so I've already mentioned the cold caller. These are salespeople masquerading as financial advisor. The salesperson may be friendly, but they are not your friend. They are not your friend. You should not confuse them with your friend. If I want to go play golf with you, that's fine. But I'm your salesperson, not your friend. I already told you just a 1% cost is 10% of investment profits, and that compounds. And there are crazy schemes, bad investments, and high costs all around. If I come to you and say, I've got a great idea for a hotel in Hawaii, let's do it. We're going to get rich. You just look at me and say, dude, uh, no. Sorry. Good luck with that. Let me know how it goes. And it's true in the financial world, it is very true. Paying more does not usually equal getting more. So how knowledgeable do you have to be? Not that knowledgeable, but you have to be knowledgeable enough to recognize the quality of my advice. Okay, newsletters, oh my gosh. You will have your, when I come visit you, Dr. Kempenick, I'm gonna say, hi. How are you doing? I've got a newsletter. I've, I, I follow it. I'm, I'm going to help you with your money. It's a very dangerous world, you know. And I subscribe to a newsletter that's outperformed the U.S. stock market by 18% for the past 20 years. No. 
No. No. No. I can guarantee, you just think about it. If I could just give me two options for my career, I can write a newsletter and sell it to you, or if I'm that knowledgeable that I can outpace the U.S. stock market by actually 1% or 2%, if, that's all, if I could do better than 1% or 2% greater than the U.S. stock, I will be incredibly wealthy on Wall Street managing billions of dollars. So am I going to write a newsletter, or am I going to go to work on Wall Street and get paid about well, it's in the hundreds of millions of dollars a year, every year. What am I going to do? I'm not going to be selling you a newsletter. Okay. Oh, my gosh. These guys. Louis Ruckheiser here, he was on PBS for decades. He had these little elves. They would predict the stock market. They were studied horrible. They were awful. They messed it up every year. He fired them routinely. They could never do it. He fired the elves. All these people are essentially entertainers. Bad for you? No. Do not listen to them. Only listen to them for entertainment. If you want entertainment, fine. But just like you wouldn't go to relationship advice for the people on Housewives of New York City, <laughs> don't go to these people for advice for your finances. Okay, back to Gene Chatsky. Four habits of the wealthy. Work hard. Save habitually. Invest soundly and aggressively. And give back. So what is responsible for the success of the United States? I have absolutely zero concern about the young people in this room with respect to your ability to change the world. If I have one question, my, my question might be, I'm, I don't feel the faith that it takes it takes a lot of faith. What is responsible for the success of the United States? It's a positive outlook rooted in pragmatism, not rooted in polar extremes. A positive outlook rooted in pragmatism with the belief that tomorrow can be better than today, and we, each of us, have a moral obligation to make it so. James E. Thompson said it more succinctly, Dr. Thompson, in 1915, with the founding of the Texas Surgical Society, good work for the love of good work must be our motto. Who here thinks or hopes that the world will be better 10 years, five years from now than what it is today? I'm not going to ask for your hands. I would guess it's almost 100%. So it's not going to get better unless, unless we make it better. I showed you Jerry Groopman's version of hope. Arthur McPhee said, when he would hit me on the head with his ring, turned backwards, which hurts a lot, uh, Ronald, Surgery is not based upon hope. I, I, I didn't understand what he was saying. I mean, first I had a concussion from the, <laughs> from the hit on the head. But, 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 but for a while, I said, what does he mean by that? Well, he, he meant that it's not enough for me to say, I hope I do well on this test. I have to make certain that I do well on this test. Okay, so I... Uh, give a, a, another Sunday sermon at the ACS, Marion College of Surgeons, South Texas chapter every year. And I just said, okay, well, let's do the math. What would be the impact if, a, if each surgeon, just in the South Texas chapter, it's only half the state, if each surgeon gave $100 per month over the course of a, of a surgical career, I just calculated that as 456 gifts. That means we would give $45,600 per person over a lifetime. That comes from approximately 600 dues-paying members. Okay, <laughs> well, that's, that's over my lifetime, over my surgical lifetime, not my real lifetime. That's $27 million. 
if that were invested with an expected return of 6%, very achievable, in that 30 to 40 years, that turns into $104 million. We could endow every surgical department in the state of Texas, certainly everyone in the southern portion of Texas, with $1 million endowments everywhere. We could pay for scholarships, and we could have the world's best skill simulation labs, $104 million. But it takes persistence, and it takes giving. Pitfall three, I'm going to move along here. Unnecessary excessive debt. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, uh, but my main takeaway is debt and luxury. Shoot for a goal for no debt for luxury. If you have high debt, work on getting yourself out of debt. Debt and value, there's some good debt and there's some bad debt. The worst debt is high interest consumer debt. Pitfall four, dependence on increasing income. Well. This is an old slide, decreasing reimbursement. We've had decreasing reimbursement. If you, were to, if you were to actually probably survey you, you would say, oh, decreasing reimbursement's horrible. We're doing worse. Well, I showed you what, our, what, surge, what physician salaries were. This is also an old slide. But you can see that starting from 1929, uh, physician annual income has outpaced the people we serve significantly. Significantly. Uh, these are academic surgical salaries from 1966. An assistant professor was $15,000. That translates into about $100,000 in, uh, in inflation-adjusted funds. Uh, the chair was $30,000. That translates into about $202,000. There's been a significant amount of inflation. So as I'm trying to convince you to be skeptical, you should be very skeptical from, from me that I can't predict what's going to happen to physician income. It may actually increase at that same rate. The bottom line is it's impossible to predict. You can't predict what's going to happen. But we have to be aware that physician income is higher now in the U.S. than at any time in modern history. It's not unique to us. It's true in other skilled professions. But remember, it's in building wealth, it's not what you earn, it's what you save. Pitfall five, lack of preparation. You absolutely critically need disability insurance. You need term life insurance at a level that's commensurate with your age and liabilities. You need an emergency fund. If you're self-employed, you need a, a pretty sizable emergency fund. If you're employed with a more stable income, you probably need less. And lastly, you need to protect your investment in the profession. What I mean, I'm going to be really direct. Don't do crazy stuff. Keep current. Be compliant. Don't get yourself into situations where you risk your entire profession. Don't do crazy stuff. So wrapping up, the principles, a positive outlook rooted in reality, pay yourself first, live simply, invest simply, manage risk, increase your basic financial literacy, and give back. What about actions? Save at least 15% of your income into a low-cost mutual fund mimicking the U.S. stock and bond market. Salespeople are not your friends. If for those of you who have friends with salespeople, I'm not telling you to go be mean to them but you just need to recognize they're not really your friend or your advisor. If they were your friend or your, or, or your advisor, you need to separate that sales relationship. Reduce debt if you can. Set a goal for no debt for luxuries. Aim for less reliance on our uh, income or salary. Prepare for the unexpected. And we each have an obligation to make things better. And we can't do that. We can't make it better without strong personal finances. And coming 100 or so years later in Camille, you can see the words uh, resonate. Happy to answer any questions.
questions? Hey, Dr. Pounds. Yeah. Uh, well, if you haven't, if you've, any, a lot of people don't pay much attention to the news. But if you if you pay attention to the news, actually, it's a big controversy in the in the financial world of whether whether your financial advisor or someone managing your funds should sign something that says their fiduciary responsibility is to you. The majority of them disagree with that. Whereas you would take that as a given the basis of medicine, you would take that, if you're violating that, you would be called not professional. Uh, so if you have a personal, uh, uh, and, there, and there are really great financial advisors. I don't mean to, to, to they're really great, great people doing it. Uh, but they should be willing to si sign a fiduciary uh, statement that says their responsibility is primarily to you, not the company that they're working for. And, and some, there, there's easy, I mean, there's many prevalent ways that they may not be employed by a company, but they get a, a commission on things, investment vehicles they sell to you. They should be willing to be your, uh, to, to sign that fiduciary statement. And probably more importantly, they should all be paid as a fixed fee, not as a percent of your, uh, of your investment portfolio. Here's what they're going to tell you. And it's not all untrue. There's not. It's not totally untrue. Is that okay? My name's Ronnie Stewart, uh, Dr. Van Sickle. I'm. I'm got my newsletter, uh, and uh, I want you to pay me one percent of your portfolio. That way, if you, ma I don't. I don't get paid if you if you make if you don't make money. Not true. If the stock market loses 20% and I'm getting paid 1% of your assets, I get paid like 20% less, but I still get paid even though you lost a bunch of money. But that does not really serve your interests well, particularly when that person, if you do not have enough power in the marketplace, so that means you're not a billionaire, and that person's working for a whole bunch of other people, really doesn't work. So you need somebody who's willing to, give, to, to say their, in, their interests are you, and you should pay them intermittently, not based on a percent of your assets.